Hello, this is Josh Patel, and today we're going to be finishing Chapter 6 in Biology, which was all about Mendel and meiosis. Right now we're going to do 6.4, which is traits, genes, and alleles. Our key concept is genes encode proteins that produce a diverse range of traits. So, the same gene can have many versions. A gene is a piece of DNA that directs a cell to make a certain protein. So we should already know that DNA is basically a set of instructions that our cells use to function. So to function, our cells use DNA to produce proteins, and there are many different proteins that do many different things. Each gene has a locus, or a specific position, on a pair of homologous chromosomes. So this is a picture of an allele on a chromosome. So the blue and the green are a chromosome, and the little yellow strip in the middle is an allele, is a allele for a wrinkled cell, basically. An allele is any alternative form of a gene occurring at a specific locus on a chromosome. So it's basically a gene on a specific area. So this is the specific area, which would be an allele. Each parent donates one allele for every gene. So every gene you have, so like your eye color, your parents both donate a certain allele. Homozygous describes two alleles that are the same at a specific locus. So, and heterozygous describes two alleles that are different at a specific locus. In any science, homo is always the same and hetero is always different, and that's basically all you need to know. So homozygous alleles are identical to each other. So this top picture, they're the same, they're in the same exact spot, the same exact wrinkled allele. And a heterozygous, it's one's wrinkled, one's round, so they're they're different. And heterozygous alleles are different from each other. Genes influence the development of traits. All of an organism's genetic material is called the genome. So that's like the broadest you can get. A genotype refers to the makeup of a specific set of genes. So the set of genes that make up your hair color, your eye color would be a genotype. And then a phenotype is the physical expression of a trait. So that would be if you have blue eyes, blonde hair, brown hair, whatever. Alleles can be represented using letters. A dominant allele is expressed as a phenotype when at least one allele is dominant. A recessive allele is expressed as a phenotype when two copies are present, and dominant alleles are represented by uppercase letters, while recessive alleles are represented by lowercase letters. So dominant is more in charge while recessive can't take in charge. So for your phenotype to show, so let's say for you to have blonde hair, and blonde hair is a recessive trait. So let's say to have blonde hair, you would have to have two recessive genes. So this would be showed as two lowercase letters. Let's use B for blonde. You would have two lowercase Bs to have blonde hair. If you have a capital B, and let's say black hair is the other only color you can have. So capital B would make you have black hair. You just have to have one capital B because it automatically overpowers the recessive. So capital B, capital B would be black hair. Capital B, lowercase b would also be black hair. And so this is another example. This is our genotype and we have a wrinkled gene or allele and a round allele and the round is dominant. So in this phenotype, our round allele is dominant, so we have at least one of that. And in this phenotype, it's wrinkled, so we have to have two wrinkled alleles right here. We have both of them are wrinkled. So both homozygous dominant and heterozygous genotypes yield a dominant phenotype. So this was when I was saying to have blonde hair, you can either have two capital Bs or one capital B, lowercase b. So homozygous would be two capital Bs and hetero would be one capital, one lowercase. Most traits occur in a range and do not follow simple dominant recessive patterns. So this is just the simplest you can get, but not everything follows this pattern. So now we're going to be doing 6.5, which is traits and probability. The inheritance of traits follows the rules of probability. We're going to be using some simple math to figure out probability here. 
the Punnett square illustrates genetic crosses, so this is the math here. The Punnett square is a grid system for predicting all possible genotypes resulting from a cross. So the axes represent the possible gametes of each parent, and the boxes show the possible genotypes of the offspring. So the Punnett square is a grid system for predicting possible genotypes of offspring. Up here we have parent, the parent one alleles, and here we have the parent two alleles. It doesn't. You can switch these. It doesn't really matter. So parent one here has capital A lowercase a, and parent two has capital A lowercase a. So that means in both of these parents they have the dominant trait. So if it was the blonde hair case, they would both have black hair because black hair is dominant. And so to do the Punnett square, you take the first from the first parent, put it down here, and the first from the second parent, put it down here. And you just cross over all the letters. So for this box here, it would be this A and that A. For this box, it would be this lowercase A, that capital A. For this, it would be this lowercase A, that lowercase A. And what these four boxes tell us is what the possible children could have, what their alleles are. Here in this first square, they're both, they have both dominant alleles, meaning that it's a purebred species, or not species, but it's a purebred animal, meaning it has either both capital or both lowercase, so it'd be homo. And since it's a capital A, it means it's dominant, so it'd be homozygous black hair. And in this one, in the last square, it'd be two recessive, so it'd be homozygous blonde, because the lowercase a would be the recessive trait. And in here, since there's one of each, the dominant trait is still the one that shows. So these both would be hetero, but it would still be black hair. So the Punnett square yields the ratio of possible genotypes to phenotypes. A monohybrid cross involves one trait, so that's what we just did. Monohybrid crosses examine the inheritance of only one specific trait, homozygous dominant, and all this other stuff. It's just like showing that you can have ratios between the different if you use different alleles, you get different outcomes. So in this case, we're going to use a dominant one here, or a homozygous dominant. So it would be capital F, capital F. And here we're using a homozygous recessive, which would be lowercase and lowercase. So here we can tell that recessive is white and, whoops, and dominant is purple. So to do the Punnett score, you just cross, cross the F, so capital F. So everything's going to have a capital F and everything's going to have a lowercase f. It's going to be capital F, lowercase f for all of them. And they're going to be purple because purple is the dominant trait. So this is just showing that you can, there's different ratios for different types, different combinations. So here we're going to do two heteros, I guess, plants. And since purple is dominant, capital F is purple. So our outcome is going to be capital F, capital F, a mix of both, and lowercase, lowercase. But here we have a purple producing a white, and that's strange. But it makes sense because lowercase f is recessive, and in this one box, they both match up. So you can produce a recessive out of two phenotypes that look dominant. So a test cross is a cross between an organism with an unknown genotype and an organism with a recessive phenotype. So let's say we knew what the white one was because it's white, it has to be lowercase f and lowercase f. There's no other possibility it can be because if it has a capital F, it has to be purple. So we know this one is lowercase, lowercase. And let's say we didn't know what this purple one is. So we didn't know it was capital F, lowercase f. It was like blank and blank. And th these were its offsprings. We knew the offsprings. We had two recessive and two heterodominant. We would have to know that this one would be a hetero too, because if it was, let's say, if it was capital F, capital F, these two bottom ones would have to be purple because it has a capital F in it, and they would all be the same. But in this case, it's not. It's these two are recessive, which means that the parent has to have a recessive allele to give off to them, making it capital F lowercase f.
a dihybrid cross involves two traits, so it's not as simple as a monohybrid, but it's still doable. And Mendel's dihybrid cross with heterozygous plants, so two heteros, yields a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. This is a ratio that we have to know, it's very important. It comes up on test very often. So Mendel's dihybrid cross led to his second law, the law of independent assortment. The law of independent assortment states that alleles pair separate independently of each other during meiosis. So the alleles are separate and they can form different genes. So we'll get to the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio later, or it's right here. So to do a dihybrid cross, you have to take, you have to have two genes first of all. So these are two separate genes, the Y's and the R's, and they're both hetero, they're both the same plant or same, they both have the same alleles. So here we have capital Y lowercase y, capital R lowercase r, and to get these different genes to put here, you have to foil, like in math, which is front, outer, inner, last. So you put the first two together, so capital Y and capital R together, and then you do the outer, so Y, capital Y, lowercase r, inner, lowercase y, capital R, and last, which is y and r. So we're basically splitting this in half and using the y's and the r's as our two things to foil. And so you put them here and then you cross them just like any other Punnett square. So you take the y from here, you put it there, the y from there, you put it there. So you have two capital y's and two capital r's. Here you have two capital y's, one capital r, one lowercase r. And you keep doing that and you eventually get the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 because you have 9 of the yellow and round ones. You have 3 of the yellow wrinkle ones, 3 green round ones, and 1 all recessive wrinkled and green. So heredity patterns can be calculated with probability. Probability is the likelihood that something will happen. Probability predicts the average number of occurrences, not an exact number. So the Punnett score is basically probability. Probability equals number of ways a specific event can occur over the number of total possible outcomes. Probability applies to random events such as meiosis and fertilization. So this is just a simple, well, an example of probability using a coin. So 6.6, .6, meiosis and genetic variation. Our key concept is independent assortment and crossing over during meiosis results in genetic diversity. So we're gonna talk about how genetic diversity happens. Sexual reproduction creates unique combinations of genes. So as we learned earlier, sexual reproduction produces, gene, produces cells that have half the DNA and two half DNA cells have to combine to produce one organism. And this produces more genetic diversity than asexual reproduction that just produces the same thing over and over again. So unique phenotypes may give a reproductive adva advantage to some organisms. Sexual reproduction creates unique, com creates unique combinations of genes. Independent assortment of chromosomes in me meiosis. So this is what helps us become genetically diverse. And random fertilization of gametes. So in this independent assortment was one of Mendel's laws. And this is just a picture showing how diverse our world can be. So crossing over during meiosis increases genetic diversity. Crossing over is exchange of chromosomes segments between two homologous chromosomes. So as we know, homologous chromosomes are all our genes and all the DNA we have. And in the first phase of meiosis, so prophase one of meiosis one, they are chromosomes get really close together and they like interlock and once they split, they kind of trade the genes they have. So it like rearranges things. So this results in new combination of genes. So here's the picture crossing over exchange segments of DNA between homologous chromosomes. So in prophase one, two homologous chromosomes pair up with each other during prophase one. So prophase, as we know, is the first phase where everything gets closer together and the nuclear membrane starts to split. But 
while it's still in the nuclear membrane, the DNAs get close together, and in some positions, some chromatids are very close to each other, and the segments cross over. And when these segments break off, they reattach to the closest chromosome, and they create a new type of, like a new remix of chromosomes. Chromosomes contain many genes, and the farther apart two genes are located on a chromosome, the more likely they are to be separated by crossing over. So genes located closer together on a chromosome tend to be in inherited together, which is called genetic linkage. Genetic linkage allows the distance between two genes to be calculated. So here we see gene A and gene B are very close to each other. So they will not be affected by crossing over. That's why we call them that's why we call them genetic linkage. And same with genes C and D. But A and B are not linked to C and D because they are so far apart. Crossing over is likely to occur in the space between. So all here, this is the most likely spot where the genes will cross over or split apart and reattach. So that's it with chapter 6, which was all about meiosis and Mendel. And see you next time at chapter 7.